to the next paper by Eugene Taylor, entitled Mortality and Self-Realization. Thank you. It's always appropriate to begin with a few caveats. Uh, my uh, lower self read this paper to my higher self the other day, and it's 31 minutes. <laughs> now that I've won that concession, uh, I uh, wanted to tell you that uh, I just want to make one remark about uh, this issue of possession and uh, studying possession by the devil. Made in the last. We have some information on that. This was an Episcopalian who came back and told us that um, he had been to hell and that uh, they took him to this cave and they showed him in there in this cave that there was a group of people. And uh, they were all being boiled in oil. He said, well, what did they do? And uh, he was told that they would be Jews who ate pork. And they went to the next cave, and there were people who were being boiled in oil and being poked with pitchforks. And he said, well, what, what did they do? And he said, well, they were Catholics who uh, ate meat on Friday. And then he went to the next cave, and there were these people who were being boiled in oil and poked and set on fire. And he said, my God, what did they do? He was told that they were Episcopalians who had eaten their main course with their salad fork. <laughs> <laughs> the moral being that uh, only the Christians may struggle with the devil. But in the course of the next 30 minutes, there are three interrelated ideas that I would like to leave together for discussion. The first of these is my view that psychic phenomena exist as a byproduct of self-realization, not an end. Uh, and for that reason, uh, it's this process of self-realization that should be the proper subject matter of research in the paranormal. Second is the idea that active exploration of the subconscious in some way simulates or actually brings us closer to the death experience. In both cases, I believe that personality transformation is the result. And finally, the main point I would like to leave you with is that while psychic phenomena and near-death states may be real, it hardly occurs to most of us when we attempt to describe them to our neighbor or to construct a science about them, that our descriptions may have little to do with the actual experience. At the very least, in the end, I hope to have left no doubt about my view that the totality of our experience in the immediate moment far transcends our conceptualization of it, that the symbolic capacities each one of us has constitutes an essence extractor far superior to any man-made method or apparatus for measuring reality, and that in the final analysis, not scientific data, but our immediate experience is the doorway to an awakened consciousness, the realization and clear articulation of which constitutes, in my opinion, one of the most important challenges facing any legitimate science of the future. I'd like to begin by recounting two personal events about our mortality. <coughs> The first concerns the death of my maternal grandfather at the age of 79. I was 17 at the time, attending high school across the street from the rest home where he stayed. You should also know that he lived in the same room with me for a year before he went in there, so we had developed something of a personal communication. The day he died, the authorities would not permit me to leave school when the rest home called to say that he was failing, so I went over immediately at the last bell and arrived just moments after he had passed away. My mother met me in front of the waiting room and asked me if I wanted to see him, which kind of took me by surprise, and I reflexively said yes. What happened next came very quickly. He was still in a room with six other patients, but his bed was surrounded by a screen. The nurse who showed me in suddenly walked away, and I was immediately confronted with a lifeless body. I did not feel the presence of the other people just beyond the screen. Instead, I was hypnotically focused on the figure in the bed. I spontaneously sought for the person I knew, and in a whirlwind of ever-widening telescopic sensations, the answer I got was that he was both there and not there. He was not in the body, but I sensed that he was present. Well, then I asked myself, where, where was he? It was at this point that I had an oceanic experience. I felt as if my horizons expanded incredibly fast into some farther reaches which had no end. He did not speak to me. There was no voice, only communion. 
I suppose I was only in there a few minutes, but I had lost count as it was a time transcendent moment. I live with that moment to this day as if the past was not there, as if there wasn't even any past. The second event concerns the recent death of my father this past Mother's Day. If there are fates at work in the world, or if there is a divine personage synchronistically rolling the dice, surely such forces were symbolically at work for it to have occurred on that cave. I will spare you the details except to say that he had been mortally ill for five years, during which he had survived, even recovered from heart surgery and multiple operations. Then, despite the agony which preceded it, he left this world in no pain, a completely changed man, who all along, it turns out, had been courageously unafraid of his own death. His eminent demise was expected by the family, but the reality of his passing, its enormity, its finality, nevertheless radically changed my consciousness. My state was profound, a hyper-suggestible and surreal condition, the kind of which psychic events are made. I saw visions, heard voices, foretold events, transported objects, had out-of-the-body experiences, and in general understood that our run-of-the-mill business-as-usual state of mind was a complete illusion, despite the fact that I was hopeful to get back there as soon as possible. No fact could help me. No amount of objective information would suffice. I had no theories. I was beyond theory. Well, yes, I did. Actually, I had many theories. But of course, none were the right one. I could only exist in an infinite sea of emotion. I'm telling you this because there is likely no one among us who has escaped these experiences. Their relevance to the present discussion is that when they come to us, they are among the few important events that shape a person's life. Usually we can count the number of these experiences on one hand. They have primacy over all else. They are the benchmarks of our unfolding personal destiny. Further, they put scientific facts in a light not normally conceived by all the textbooks of experimental method and all the pundits of high culture combined. They remind us of the important distinction made by Western and Eastern philosophers alike, what William James called the superiority of immediate acquaintance with versus simply knowledge about something. The Buddhists speak of paramartha sakya versus sambriti sakya. Mere factual knowledge of the world is compared to the direct, transcendent experience of totality. We tend to forget that experience is primary and scientific knowledge is at best only an approximate model of reality, a probability statement about the norm, a working representation, and not the actual reality itself. Even in science, the meaning context always has to come from within. Mind always has to intervene. Even the most exact measurement has to be interpreted by someone. Think on the one hand of the scientist who chooses his subject matter because that's where the grant funding is. Or the investigator who, before he even launches his research, formulates his hypothesis by eliminating large parts of experience because they are not testable. Or the researcher who is confronted with, the, with conflicting results, which nevertheless require a final judgment. In the last analysis, his choice will always be based on personal sentiment. On the other hand, we who are the recipients of its largesse have taken the scientific method and reapplied it into a worldview. We have sometimes unwittingly, but more often with eyes wide open, bought into the assumption that only by objective methods can truth be known. And perforce, it is only a short further step to the larger metaphysical belief that the philosophy of science is then the only legitimate philosophy upon which modern people should build their lives. Meanwhile, we may hold conceptualizations about ultimate reality radically different from those required in reductionistic science. Such differences in worldview, even when we think we are being scientific, lead, in my opinion, to radical differences in what we consider legitimate evidence. Here is one instance where an older woman, the supervisor of a retirement complex, believes she has the power to be a channeler. She takes a continuing education course on the subject and informally tries her skill on some of the tenants where she works. She finds that she is able to make accurate readings on many of them, corroborated by their verbal reports to her of foretold events that later came true. This woman is now absolutely convinced that these powers are real, precisely because they are real for her and she has tested them. Her evidence, however, is all experiential. No amount of laboratory data and no scientific theory to the contrary will convince her otherwise. 
Here in another case is a distinguished team of researchers at a prestigious Ivy League university who have set up a laboratory to study the effects of conscious choice on the measurement of objective recording devices. After several years of exacting trials, they believe they have statistically significant data to show the effect of consciousness on matter independent of mediating influences through the sense organs. The problem is that none of their more skeptical colleagues will believe the data. No one will replicate their work, much less discuss it in a scientific forum in a manner that would have any real impact on the way most of science is conducted. In this case, their colleagues throughout the university and the professions have implicitly proclaimed by their silence that if new facts do not fit prevailing theories about reality, then so much the worse for the facts. As one distinguished molecular biologist put it, if what the psychical researchers <coughs> said were true, then it would already have been taken up by other laboratories and tested, and we would have heard these final results by now. We have heard nothing, ergo, there must have been nothing there in the first place. Sentiment, again, I maintain, plays a major role in such responses. What then is this penchant in parapsychology for exact measurement and replication of minute effects in the laboratory? What is this drive towards the objective collection of anecdotal facts in the clinical setting? And what can this mode of investigation have to tell us about psychic phenomena and the experience of death? The very history of the field suggests that psychical research has survived because it has already made major contributions, not to physics, but to experimental psychopathology, to psychotherapeutics, and to the evolution of the so-called soft sciences of personality, abnormal, social, and clinical psychology. Yet these advances were not solidified and built upon, but rather marginalized within the field under the rubric of parapsychological death psychology. Instead, psychical research, in being renamed parapsychology, has come to mean laboratory-based experiments performed according to the methodology of the natural sciences, or else the collection of verbal reports in a clinical setting, which are then analyzed and cast into the context of some theoretical model. By giving preeminence to this approach, parapsychology has thus made many of the same epistemological mistakes that the rest of the sciences continue to make about the nature and province of inward experience. We must now ask ourselves, even if we can show data for the existence of psychic powers in the laboratory or some clinic, then what does this mean? Cast into the wrong context, I maintain, the inward meaning of such events can never be revealed. Their proper context, I shall maintain, is not the replication of psychic phenomena in the laboratory, or the finding of lost children, wallets, or dead bodies, or even communication with the part of loved ones. The proper context lies within the domain of self-knowledge, the refinement of character, the evolution and transformation of consciousness, the actualization of our higher nature. In Zen, they refer to both the experience of polishing this inward mirror, as well as the transcendence of all such formulations. Its language is not the measurements of the mathematicians, the syllogisms of the logicians, or the abstractions of the philosophers. Its discourse is rather carried on in the songs of the heart, the intuitions of poetry, the light of insight. It is neither numerical nor logical, but it transcends both. Its true power is symbolic, metaphoric, mythic, and visionary. The inward method, moreover, is any means by which we can effect an internal opening of the doors of perception. Psychologically, this may be expressed in the various kinds of techniques we master to induce an altered state at will. The practice of breath control, the performance of meditation, the contemplation of inspired poetry, an act of hallowed movement. We may actually try to find ways to free the mind from its lower fetters. So the Zen koan asks, where does the white go when the snow melts? What did your face look like before your mother's womb? When you die and they scatter your ashes to the wind, where are you? Here we come upon the fruitful idea that exploration of the subconscious simulates the death experience, that there is some intrinsic relationship between our ability to transcend the bounds of everyday waking consciousness and the experience that happens to us at the end of physical life. This process in simulating the departure of the spirit from its material form while remaining alive in the same body I shall refer to as a symbolic death of the ego. Here, the filtering mechanism that separates us from the world is disbanded. Individual identity merges into the collective. We are inundated by contents from the collective reservoir. Self and not self become one for a moment until we recollect ourselves at an entirely new level. We are called upon at certain prescient moments to leave behind a former self and take on a new and wider identity. We die in order to come to life. 
All this lies within our grasp in the immediate moment, either because we have found meaning through suffering, or we have discovered a higher life through the less painful but more difficult process of actualizing our values. Because we are constrained by our ability to conceptualize the whole of reality, all of psychology, as William James suggested, may be nothing more than a colossal elaboration of the ego. The very act of conceptualization dooms our expression to the inherent limits of language and discursive thought. The school that has dominated linguistics too long is the one which believes that if a word does not exist for something, then that something must not exist. Normative language and thought are, of course, always going through their own evolution. They will always lag behind experience, just as our social institutions, founded on insight, by their very nature, work to prevent the kind of innovation that created them in the first place. The process of personal transformation proceeds apace, nevertheless, meaning that our present-day cultural institutions, now more than ever, no longer accurately express the breadth and depth of the experiences brought to these institutions by its members. Experience always transcends thought. Our forgetfulness of this in a modern technologically driven society dooms us to the insanity of believing that if we only had a model of death, we would know what it is. A comedian recently pointed this out to his audience when he made a few jokes about the concept of a living will and the desire to avoid heroic measures at the end. But suppose, for instance, he said, that the vegetative state is the most desirable from the standpoint of achieving both our narcissistic wish to cling to life and our urge to experience eternity. Suppose that in this condition, we actually get all that we have been looking for. All of our material needs are taken care of through life support systems. We do not have to struggle to survive. We do not have to answer what our detractors have to say about us or listen to the triviality of the masses. We even find out who loves us the most because they are the ones who keep us constant company at the bedside. Meanwhile, we supposedly remain conscious at a very deep level to all that goes on. It's just not apparent to anyone else. Yet there we are, perched on the edge of the abyss. All of inward creation lies before us. The firmament is constantly within view. We bask in the higher light. Why on earth and in heaven's name would we want to pull the plug? Our sensibilities are repelled, however, at the implicit narcissism of presuming that we can still cling to this earthly body and also be able to enter into the next life. Here is the celebrated case of the respected physician, Dr. George Ritchie, a man who died and came back to life, having seen the realms of the heavens and the hells, events that were to later happen to him, even the great white light of the void, but whose single most important characteristic was a transformed consciousness. People afterwards described his immense peace, his even-mindedness, his beatitude. He himself said that the most significant change that came over him was his never-ceasing awareness of the divinity in each person, which he saw to one extent or another as he gazed into the soul of every individual whom he met afterwards. Experientially, he had discovered that only love overcomes death, transcends death, is the very bridge between life and death. As a young doctoral student, Raymond Moody heard Ritchie speak in 1965, and believing this to be the first fully documented case of near-death experience, Moody was led to his further now widely known investigation. So Aldous Huxley, unbeknownst to anyone, read the Tibetan bardo photo to his dying wife, Maria. Alone with her, he reassure, reassured her over and over that she should turn towards the light, the single most important experience at the moment of transition, the duration of which would determine the next karmic domain of one's rebirth. That he had read the book to her and that she had been guided by this light was later spontaneously reported to Huxley by Eileen Garrett from what was described as an after-death communication with Maria. All of Christian science is, in fact, based on this revelation of the light. In 1866, after she had been healed of a nervous condition by Phineas Quimby, Mary Baker Patterson, then recently divorced, had a serious fall on the ice and dislocated her spine. Semi-conscious and initially in great pain, she was taken to a nearby house, but against her doctor's orders, she soon had herself removed to her own home. She refused to take the prescribed medicine, having no faith in it, she said, and choosing instead to have only friends and church members around her. At one point, alone with only her Bible, she turned to one of the healing episodes of Jesus, and she later wrote, His words began to flood into her thoughts. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but through me. She was suddenly filled with the conviction that her life was in God, and at that moment she was healed. The core of her realization was that faith in matter was error. Mind is all, matter nothing, became her watchword. 
Having recourse, she said, only to her own interest resources and sustained only by her Bible, she resolved to place herself solely in God's hands and by this means achieved the regeneration she sought. Christian science thus dates its beginnings from this experience. Likewise, recovery from alcoholism has been found, it has been found, is often accompanied by an experience of the transcendent. Bill Wilson, the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, in 1933 had checked into the Townsend Hospital in New York City for the third time, facing, he believed, either insanity or imminent death from his prolonged drinking. Instead, he had a white light experience upon which he later built a 12-step program. He says, my depression deepened unbearably, and finally it seemed to me as though I were at the bottom of the pit. I still gagged badly at the notion of a power greater than myself, but finally, just for the moment, the last vestige of my proud honesty was crushed. All at once I found myself crying out, if there is a God, let him show himself. I am ready to do anything, anything. Suddenly my room blazed with an indescribably white light. I was seized with ecstasy beyond description. Every joy I had known was pale by comparison. The light, the ecstasy, I was conscious of nothing else for a time. Then, seen in the mind's eye, there was a mountain. I stood upon its summit. There were there where a great wind blew. A wind not of air, but of spirit. In great clean strength it blew right through me. Then came the blazing thought, you are a free man. I know not at all how long I remained in this state, but finally the light and the ecstasy subsided. I again saw the wall of my room. As I became more quiet, the great peace stole over me, and this was accompanied by a sensation difficult to describe. I became acutely conscious of a presence which seemed like a veritable sea of living spirit. I lay on the shores of a new world. This, I thought, must be the great reality, the God of the creatures. Wilson's recovery is well documented, but little known is the fact but he soon became a practicing spiritualist, held numerous seances to convince atheistic drunks that there was something beyond themselves to believe in, and allegedly received communications from William James and St. Francis from beyond the grave. This is the inward reason he always recommended to AA readers Little Flowers of St. Francis and James's Varieties of Religious Experience, and always spoke of James as a founder of AA, although the Harvard psychologist had been long dead before Wilson's organization was actually launched. If all this theistic Christian language is not to your liking, we can just as easily turn to the non-theistic yoga texts of India. I have chosen to comment on Sutra 22 of Book 3, Vibhuti, the acquisition of supernormal powers. The text says, Sopakrama, Nirupakrama, Cha Karma, Tat Samyama, Dabaran, Janana Marishkebyo Va. The rough translation of this passage is that karma is either fast or slow in fructifying. By practicing samyama on either karma or portents, foreknowledge of death can be acquired. The meaning of this sutra is that the effects of all thoughts, words, and deeds come to fruition either right away or over time. If they come to fruition over time, then they have been stored as unconscious seeds or bija, which will sprout forth when conditions are right. If the conditions are right in the immediate moment, they will have their effect right now. In advanced yoga practice, samyama is the threefold tool of attention, concentrated meditation, and absorption into any object of perception. The purpose of yoga is the promotion of insight, not into the objects themselves, but into their illuminating quality, which leads to the experience of pure consciousness independent of inert matter. One byproduct of achieving this experience is the ability to see into past and future lives, or into successive individual moments of consciousness. In this process, past karma is either burned up or to be lived out. Burning is immediate liberation, while residual karma defines the state of the next rebirth. Samyama, on the effects of karma, thus allows one to witness the speed of karma fruition, and thus knowledge of the present end of this life can be gathered. And then there's additional note. The mention of portents simply means that one can foretell one's death by looking within. There is no sound on closing the ears or visual illumination when pressing the closed eye. One may see messengers of death or wraiths of departed relatives, or one may suddenly see the heavens or spirits, or perceive everything contrary to what has been seen before. So you see that rather than mere science or more clinical data, I am an advocate of the poetic imperative. Instead of always allowing external circumstances to define our inward reality for us, I feel that we need to rekindle living myths and energetic symbols as the basic tools 
that assist us in defining what is most central to our own true nature. We need to realize that despite the fact that words are a major source of pain and misunderstanding, that language can be a vehicle for its own transcendence. We must emphatically assert that the iconography of the transcendent cannot be excluded simply on epistemological grounds from any science that purports to explain the whole of reality. This charges us, however, with the necessity of framing the psychology of inner experience subtle enough and significant enough to speak to the hidden assumptions of current rationalist thought, to pose a significant enough alternative to the long-standing and reigning drift towards nihilistic materialism, and to create a new way of thinking about reality fit to address the complex demands of the future. What is at stake is tremendous. For one, there is the cultural definition of personality, and hence our educational experience will be shaped. Are we going to continue to train only the rational and sensory faculties to the detriment of the emotions and the intuitions? Are we to continue to produce generation after generation of people whose main purpose is to spew out more data? Are we to ignore the attendant growth and refinement of the moral and aesthetic qualities that must go into guiding science and the larger enterprise of human thought towards higher ends? Another issue is the role of the mind in healing. Will it be eliminated and forgotten? Or more hopefully, will it be incorporated into an integrated picture of higher human functioning? Will mechanistic biology continue to find innovative ways to appropriate from the domain of the spirit in a way that reduces effects to mere techniques? Or will the legal and exclusive power to heal pass out of the hands of specialists and back to the patient, but now in some collaborative new effort that neither could have foreseen in the past? There have, in fact, been generations of visionaries who have spoken to the same old theme that confront us anew, but now more urgently. The death of personal freedom, the enslavement of the individual, the destruction of the planet, as well as the more existential questions of who we are and the meaning of life and death. We are called upon, as the voice of a new generation, to forge the base metals of science and the spirit into some as yet unidentified alloy that adequately speaks to the modern problems of consciousness. It seems important to remember that this process goes on nowhere else but in the crucible of our own immediate experience, and in the expansion of our present state of consciousness. It is here that these questions must be confronted. And even if we cannot fashion a final objective answer about them, suppose by considering them in this light that personality transformation is the result. I see, however, that I have at last run out of time, so I will leave you with that proverbial epitaph carved from the tombstone of a recently deceased spiritualist which read, to be continued. <laughs> Steve Brown. Eugene, I appreciate your emphasis on uh, experience and its proper role in any kind of reason and full-blown view of reality. But I'm, I, I want to make sure that you're not saying something which is obviously false. Um, <laughs> you yeah. say that uh, we tend to forget that experience is primary. You say that uh, experience always transcends thought. And you draw a distinction between uh, say the scientific way of uh, understanding the world and the direct experience that we have of various kinds of uh, events. And what concerns me about that is the suggestion, maybe you didn't mean to be making the suggestion, that uh, when we leave the scientific uh, mode of cognition and resort to the more direct experience of whatever it is we're experiencing, that somehow that mode of understanding nature is um, more direct and more likely to be accurate than the other. I mean, it, it may be true that there's a respect in which experience transcends thought, but it's never exactly independent of it. And especially once we're adults, all of our experience, it seems to me, is shot through with cognitive elaboration that we couldn't divest ourselves, uh, even if we wanted to. That's one reason why human empiricism is doing it now. Um, I noticed that you made experience the object of a preposition. What did I say? You expect me to remember? <laughs> yeah. I noticed that your emphasis on experience, and this is precisely my point. My, my point is that, that, yes, I make the claim that direct experience is superior to scientific knowledge within its proper and appropriate domain. And what I basically wish to challenge is the notion that it's all the same domain, when really we are operating at a naive and ignorant level where there could possibly be many domains. I don't challenge that. 
Okay, well then, why, why then make the claim that, as you just did, that direct experience is likely to be more accurate? How did I say that? That's what I'm asking. <laughs> um, it seems to me that it's, in fact, calling it direct, I think it's somewhat uh, No, okay, well then, uh, uh, we had this really great conference at Duke University, uh, and where I tried to make a preliminary statement there, of course you were there at that. Uh, and what I tried to say there was that uh, I don't think that we know enough right now to construct a legitimate science of the spirit. And I think that we are in a better position to empower the individual in ways in which the individual has actually lost that capacity in a modern technological situation by actually separating these domains. Because I don't think to be more accurate means simply appropriating experience as another category into the scientific domain. That's not what I mean at all. That what I'm talking about is not just another little kind of item in your pantheon of understandings as far as discriminations of cognitive reality is concerned. I'm talking about a radical transformation of context, of worldview, and that those kinds of transformations happen right here. They happen right here to us. And it's at periodic intervals when the most important experiences happen to us that those doors are flung open and we see that. And those are the experiences that change, not the scientific information. Now, the only thing I'm trying to posit at this particular point is that I can have an experience and you can sit there and watch me and give me an object of description of it, okay? Now, my claim is that it is different to simply just say, oh, you're talking about direct experience. That is a piece of objective information about what you heard me said, and that was not what I was talking about. What I'm talking about is the inner phenomenological domain where I live. All right, and that, that has you know, states of consciousness associated with it. I have an elaborate metaphorical and visionary language of inner experience to understand those domains. Maybe I haven't looked within, and, and basically I stay kind of trapped in that domain between the demands of external material reality and my lack of self-knowledge or my lack of a language of discrimination. But I claim that you cannot likely take the totality of inward experience and simply put it out there and say, well, we can observe it, collect facts about it, and measure it, and theory about it, and know what it is, and learn how to control it, and overcome death, and live to be immortal, and I don't, you know, to me, by the time you've gotten there, you've missed the point completely. The personality transformation does not happen by that route. That's really the main point that I'm trying to emphasize. I understand, and I don't, I don't believe I'm challenging it. Let me try one more time to, uh, to make clear what it is I'm saying. Notice one of the ways you describe it. See, I'm not challenging the transformative power of um, certain kinds of episodes in a person's life, and I don't mean to minimize those at all. Um, what it has to do with is, for example, you described it as opening the doors. And I think the implication to that is that somehow what you're getting at is you're just getting at reality in a way which you might not otherwise. Some, some sort of immaculate perception. Maybe something like that. I mean, you say when criticizing the scientific way of apprehending reality, mind always has to intervene. And all I'm suggesting is that mind is intervening even when it may feel as if it isn't. Well, I, I think that when we take consciousness and we extend it out there to the material world, and we make these discriminations about it, there is a modeling that goes on, a kind of a goodness of fit, where we're somehow able to make some interactions within the realm of probability which seem to allow us to gain some control over that. As long as we do that and focus external material reality out there, our attention out there, the structures of the mind become fixed, when really there is no such thing as structures of the mind. But there is as long as we continue to make these discriminations and lay down the habits and the passions and the the dreams and the hopes and desires that are translated out there into this interaction. But as soon as you take consciousness and turn it within, it all starts to move around. That's the basic principle of psychotherapy. That's the basic principle of psychopathology. That's the basic principle of spiritual discipline. And what I'm saying is, is that we live so much out there at the juncture between external material reality and consciousness connecting with it, that we've constructed this great big psychology of everything from that particular standpoint. And I'm saying that not everybody stands there. Although that seems to be where you know, Western educated intellectuals who believe in the Judeo-Christian, Greco-Roman, Western European, and Anglo-American definition of reality think that everyone else should be. And the majority of the world is simply not in that position. And, it, and that, that view does not even square with all of reality. And that is not a scientific statement that I make. 
Because what we really may be confronted with is that science may not be appropriate for understanding this domain. And if it is, then it will become a transformed science. And if it isn't, then it will simply become just one other form of useful knowledge within culture. And alternative knowledge-getting epistemologies will then emerge. And my claim is that we haven't even begun to look. Right, I'm not challenging that. Well, I very much agree with you that our culture needs to be balanced with respect to respecting experience. Um, I have been very impressed with the life transformation following that I've experienced in my studies. Uh, and I've known about those before I was you. What I was not prepared for was the agony that these people have gone through in our culture. And that these extremely powerful, meaningful experiences are not respected the way that they should be. And I think, you know, it's very difficult to communicate the, the, uh, the distress that these people are going through. And I think that the more we can do to change the culture, the better. However, I was still in caution against throwing the baby out. And scientists, I use scientific tools in my study of near death experience, and I feel as though I go back and forth between working at the computer and doing my science and using all the methodologies that I've learned and truly appreciating the experience. Just yes, no. feeling a true reverence for it. And I go back and forth between the whole time. Yes, thank you. No, not, not only that, but I, I would challenge that, though. I, I would challenge that. Because uh, that we would need both. Well, I think well, that we, well, no, just because I'm, I'm with you. All right. I'm just what I'm just looking at is, is is the notion that <laughs> that we need both, as if you know two sides of the integration are the way to get to the integration, and then both both may be wrong. That was the point that I made earlier. Uh, suppose, for instance, that really the problem that we've developed that has really developed for us is that we have so overemphasized the rational and the material that, that uh, we have made that the central focus of our reality. And then it doesn't matter about experience, or it doesn't matter about people. They can be rats, they can be black, white, or red, or yellow individuals. It doesn't matter. They just need to be subjects who can give us data. Well, I, I, I'm saying no. I, I'm saying that any, any legitimate, thoughtful approach to the problems that we have to face personally in our own lives means, for, for me, that science is just a tool for me to kind of help get a handle on this greater mystery. And, and I just, I revel, I revel in the realization that there is no religion and there is no science which has ultimately concluded why you are sitting over there and I am standing over here right now and who we do that. And to keep that foremost is to me an extraordinarily difficult thing for you and I in the modern period. I'm just often faced with the problem of uh, people thinking that because I'm trying to explain the narrative experience scientifically, this means I'm trying to explain it away, and I don't have respect for the experience. It's, and it's a trigger reaction I think happens in all of us. Like when I said that explanation about the old tag experience with Michael Grosso, and it's like, oh, well then, you know, we'll take that out of the list. No, 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 that's not what I intended at all. That, that's my point. In other words, why simply take it out of its context so it looks like any other category in science when, to me, it's true value has to do with the whole process of interpersonality transformation that we don't even understand yet. But that's really the direction it goes in. So it's natural that, that that's the type of reaction that you have. But the fact is that it's not the positivistic scientific context that your work belongs in. Because we have no consensually validated language of inner experience. We have no inward inner framework within our culture to understand you know, the living reality of our ancestors who are all dead being here with us right now this minute. Yet the majority of people in the world believe that. And we say by science that, that that isn't true. We take those people who live in those cultures and we train them in science, and they turn out to be neurotic individuals who have to compartmentalize and live in two different worlds at once. When they go into the university setting, the scientific laboratory, they believe that nothing exists in the universe, and they have to live their lives according to this philosophy of despair. And they go back home to basically their hill or wherever it is that they came from, and they take on again the, the, the mystery of basically where they came from. And knowing that basically they've already been told by Western culture that this is a dying worldview. When in fact, this to them is the view that lives. So I think we have something to learn. Well, um, okay. 
I think what I say once more is the, the key here is transforming science, not not putting it down. And you know, I, I just think that it, it's um, it's much more productive to to think about the way science can change rather than just pointing the finger at like the bad guys that. No, I, I, I agree with you. But the issue is, is that transforming science is a possibility. It is not to me necessarily the only possible option. Mm -hmm. um, I, I agree, obviously, with, with your basic premise because obviously what I study is like Justine is the experiences of people. And, and I think it's kind of uh, it's very interesting because they people who have near death experiences are convinced that what they happened, what happened to them was real, number one, and that they did share in an afterlife. I mean, you could have all the scientists in the world that said it was a hallucination of a dream or whatever, and they're not going to believe it. I mean, their own personal experience is that this is what happened to them, and this is what their reality is. However, I think they still have a question of how, how does that fit in then to, as Justine said, the culture that they live in. I mean, people that invalidate their experiences, um, and and what is the meaning for them that they quote were chosen or were they chosen? I mean, I think they have other questions that they want to know that helps them with their lives and also their their immediate situation that the scientific community doesn't address. I mean, we want to, we we're trying to address. You know, does this really prove that there's life after life, and is this is there something that really goes on? I mean, that's where the scientific people, you know, want to go. But that's not their question. I mean, their question is, is this normal? You know, how yeah. come everybody else doesn't have it? I completely agree with you. Now, it, it poses several interesting things. First of all, I apologize if I appear kind of militant. Because, <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, I have a sympathetic audience here. <laughs> but in a certain sense, uh, you know, I, I feel that some of the whole thing about data collection and model building is perpetuating the same mistakes as Alice Smith's problem in the first place. And if the transformation is going to happen here, then you know maybe that's one of the places the space might start. Uh, the other has to do with uh, the fact that um, I think that what happens to individuals when they have these experiences, no matter which method that whatever happens to them for this awakening to take place that a series of remarkable transformations begins to, to, to occur. And that is that they make new friends. That the, their books in their library changes. They start doing different things with their time. You know, they don't spend a whole lot of time on the television anymore. They're basically reading and searching and looking. And, and then what you do is you, you, know, you have two births, your biological place where you were born and the place where you come away from who you really are. And after that, it becomes a search for uh, you know, uh, spiritual compatriots and, uh, you know, the place where the soul can finally rest and call itself home. And, and th those, th that, that, that journey is like a place that you go inside yourself if you have to go alone by yourself. And then, you know, miraculously, the people you never met before start coming down the woodwork, kind of like you. But, and, and, and it can happen that they can be old, they can be young, they can be men, they can be women, they can cut across all the categories that you used to use to basically judge people. Or that you periodically still use when you get trapped back in external material reality and start thinking the way you used to be before, and get, just in case the experience wasn't transformative enough. Right? But I, I think that uh, um, uh, I, I think that what what we, we we wish is that there is more of that that inwardness about that spiritual quest, which leads to moral and aesthetic ends, not diabolical and pathological ones. That was more a part of the mainstream. In, uh, uh, in which we live, because we seem to have the ability to understand this. The, the knowledge seems to be there. I mean, the esoteric books of the East have been hidden for millions, for thousands of years, and now it's all translatable. It's all right out there. It's not like it's any big mystery. Okay, what the priests denied from the women for so many centuries, it's now all out there for everybody to basically pick up and to, to learn and understand what this is about. And I, I happen to think that our cultural institutions haven't got a clue. Uh, to what's going on, and what's happening is this is like a really spontaneous kind of bottom-up social revolution that's going on. And the United States is in a relatively unique position because of its place in the history of the Western visionary tradition to be fueling this. And this is the the, the, the whole counterculture movement in American popular folk psychology, which is now having a really remarkable impact on 
you know, uh, the way clinicians deliver care to patients. Now that everybody become more responsive, you know, where uh, this is a non-unionized re revolution of employees who now decide that they're going to take less money and not go up the corporate ladder so fast in exchange for time off and meaning so that their life is more well-rounded and management like has to respond uh, or, or they're going to lose the, some of their best people. And that there's a consistent pattern of this kind of folk revolution starting to like make demands on the institutions which then have to kind of respond. So uh, I think it's an extraordinary bottom-up type of revolution, but you can't make the claim that it, this is cutting-edge science, because it's not. It could influence science, but it is not the main, it is not scientific mainstream. I think there's kind of a misunderstanding of really where these cultural forces are coming from. It's probably preventing parapsychology from being more of what it can really be. Yeah. Yeah. Professor, you say that I, uh, enjoy the paper a great deal. Well, I enjoy it. Well, and and then uh, the the you know the experience you had uh, that of your of your grandfather I also I found very very interesting and, and significant um, and it opens up or or points points towards a whole realm of of the death experiences. That really haven't been explored, but that are, that are out there. That is the near death experience of the one who's close yes. to the one yes. who departs. And I remember that uh, that Rashan told me about the experience of, of his wife. Uh, she was out in California, and her father, uh, I believe I'm correct, and this was very um, Her father died in New York. And at, and at that moment, she had to walk into the redwoods, and she had a sort of transcending near death experience. And in this case, you know, without without any awareness of her father's death. So, uh, and, and I often wish that, that somebody, you know, that we would ask more questions, not only of the ones who are coming back, but also of the, of, of, of the ones who are by, standing by. Uh, and including the one, and including the situations where the person actually dies. Um, I, I, I remember some, um, one or two other persons who went into a euphoric state at the time of somebody's death. Um, so they were close, and, and that gets to be embarrassing, you know. And so people say, well, she's in shock, or he's in shock, and you explain the way that explain the way that way. But it, it really is, I mean, it, it, uh, it, it, it seems to be a, a genuine transcending experience that results when you follow the one that you're connected to. Right, yeah. And if that's the case, then it would probably radically transform simple things like our psychology of everyday perception. I mean, if you go back to the original issue we started at the beginning of the day, it's probably a representation. I mean, suppose that it's not an external world out there independent of the senses, but really there's a kind of a co-arising phenomena that goes on. That there's an interaction between human consciousness and actual material reality, which actually creates these things simultaneously as, 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 as it happens. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it seems to me that what you're describing, if it was the case, uh, would uh, radically transform just simple ways in which we go about doing normative science because it would overthrow some of the basic models, assumptions upon which current models of experimentation are based. Yeah. And, and this is one of the reasons why we're here is to kind of take a look at what direction parapsychology can go in to achieve exactly those kind of ends. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, uh, here, here the participatory approach connects with a sort of uh, objective scientific, sort of scientific approach. Uh, it, 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 it reminds me of the things of uh, uh, a quantum physicist, physicist that that uh, the observer affects the system that, that he or she observes. That, 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 uh, you can't quite distinguish one from the other. Right. Now, I, I feel personally uh, uh, about this quite deeply. And um, this has to do with the idea of, of my perception of the role of psychology and psychiatry potentially leading some future transformation of the social, medical, and perhaps even the natural sciences. Precisely because they are both sciences and arts. Because they are not like the hardcore naturalistic sciences, they're denigrated, matter of fact, within that hierarchy. 
precisely because they are viewed with the reality of the unconscious and they have this problem of the personal equation uh, much more than any of the other sciences have. But in that, it seems, it seems to me that they could potentially be the philosopher's stone because this really, psychology and psychiatry are the transition between the sciences and the humanities in that case. And uh, so uh, we've been playing around with this, this notion of uh, uh, reviving uh, uh, William James' idea of radical empiricism as more or less uh, uh, the way James originally meant it, which was as a critique of experimentalism in scientific psychology. And the notion is, is that uh, if you could bring about a transformation of, like, say, humanistic psychology, and to make it more like uh, the type of uh, influence in scientific psychology, which would bring about the great transformation that we're seeking, where, where all of a sudden psychology becomes, instead of a methodological science of behavior and cognition, it becomes a truly person-centered science, with science of basically a tool, right? So the revolution has to happen somewhere within psychology, and why not within psychical research, as far as its influence on psychology is concerned? Right? But up till now, the, the whole thing is to range across the domain of the sciences, which I, when I think that there's a much more concerted strategy that should be uh, There you go. Robert, uh, let Robert ask uh, his question, and what we'll be doing is going into a general discussion. We can continue with this discussion. We can also broaden it to include uh, early papers, even papers this morning, I think. Yeah, uh, I appreciate the paper. Um, I just want to remind everybody that when people start talking about what science can and can't do, there are various different conceptions about what science is. And that, um, depending on what you take it to be, um, it may be able to provide you with evidence that confirms uh, belief and reincarnation and things of that sort. Nobody ever expected science to provide one with these transformational experiences. I mean, obviously, there are private, there's private knowledge that one has as a result of certain experiences that may be repeated. And one comes to acquire knowledge of that sort. That doesn't mean, though, that you couldn't have, uh, that you have to throw out science or even that you have to demean it. Um, I'm convinced of that. Well, I tend to be convinced of the fact that uh, science can do a great deal by way of establishing things like uh, facts that are relevant to support beliefs of this sort. In other words, I may not have any transformational experiences in my life. It wouldn't follow from that that I couldn't be rationally justified in believing that some people survived their death and so on. And uh, I get the sense, I'm not picking at you, but I, I often hear you know, people talk about what science can and can't do. And I, I'm just here to tell you that you know, when you sit down among philosophers of science uh, and you start the discussion on what science is, you get an interesting um, uh, a very interesting and uh, fairly protected discussion on uh, what it is a scientific explanation is supposed to do. Not one of which is to give you transformational experiences. So, I mean, science may fail us by that regard, but nobody ever asked it to do that. So, uh, as for contemporary psychology, yeah, I think it's a mess. Um, um, but uh, for that reason, uh, oh, I mean, I don't think it's a mess. It's well, it's a mess. Uh, <laughs> But I'm not sure. If I'm not sure that what you, what you have in mind. I'm a little unclear on what you think. Maybe it's the hour. Maybe it's a little bit like it. But uh, I'm not really you sure. You a couple hours. Yeah. So I was just throwing it at you at the end. I'm, I'm not really you when I did it. Oh, okay. I'm not really not sure what what you what your thesis ends here. Uh, that somehow or another we need a new psychology based on personal experience. But I, I still think you know we have to be very careful about what science can't do I mean, to set ourselves over against it might be a serious mistake. I happen to think we have some very good empirical evidence for um, personal survival. And um, I haven't had any of those experiences. No, I, I, I'll, I'll concede I would rather see it as a tool rather than an end. You don't have to be a little bit militant in order to achieve that by one moment. The other thing is I'm reminded of a new biography that just came out of Simon Newcomb. A uh, really great piece of work. Uh, and he was an astronomer. Uh, he was the head of the first head of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. And he was, of course, head of all the big science committees for the federal government in the late 19th century. And this biography very clearly shows, although this is the new interpretation in the sociology of scientific knowledge, so there's the bias of the, the author involved here, which has to do with there were really three levels of discourse that Newcomb and his scientific colleagues engaged in. 
The one was the public image of science, in which case it was cut and dry. It wasn't the same as religion. It was numerical. It had nothing to do with anything personal. Right? And then there is the discussions that they had with their deans and with the people in the government whom they talked to in order to get funding for science. And this was a completely different kind of image. This was, this was science as a vehicle of progress, as a tool, as a weapon, as whatever they needed to say in order to basically establish that there's the scientific military industrial complex. They were at the center of it. They were the basic arbiters of it. The money came to them. They dispensed it. They produced science. And then there were the conversations they had among themselves, which is exactly the conversation you just described, where, well, we all know that it's really relative and that science is really kind of not what basically we said it was in the popular context. But the fact that these three different levels of discourse were going on simultaneously, I think, is an extremely important point for us to, to remember and a very powerful piece of information for the type of science that parapsychology purports to want to support. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, uh, a lot of what I was going to say has been said by other people, particularly by Steve. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a point. But you can say it wholeheartedly and agree with what he said. I'm going to say it. Sure. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to maybe put a slightly different spin on it. Uh, I think it's important uh, when discussing this to keep separate what our objectives are and what our methods are. Now, if the goal is to, quote, get in touch with reality, then that's the area where I really think uh, Steve hit it, hit it very much on the head. Uh, that whether you when, you, when you try to contact reality, you either do it through cognitive scientific models, uh, you know, language and equations and all that sort of thing, or you can do it uh, with experience. But I would take, uh, in some ways, almost a Buddhist, Buddhist view, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but neither of them really cut it. We have no way of really knowing whether either of those kind of experiences. I think science really boils down to experience, to experience what's on your dial, for example, your machine. And uh, you know, all these are experiences, experiences which may or may not correspond to that reality out there, assuming there is an objective reality, and we don't know that. Uh, for example, uh, talking about uh, near-death experiences, I think I, I think there are actually certain rules that would, I would think both phenomenologists and experimentalists would set. For example, that it doesn't mean that an experience is close to reality simply because it's, it's accompanied by a sense of conviction. I can have tremendous convictions when I'm drunk, but when I'm in another state, I all of a sudden realize that those convictions uh, do not square, at least with the reality that I see then. So at least I have to respect some kind of relativism. Now, personally, uh, again, using near-death experiences as, as an example, uh, I believe that taking the experience literally uh, does not correspond, to, that the experience is not the literal reality. I'm not your own about that. I'm saying you can't know that at, at a minimum. But and here's what I was talking about goals. What if the goal is, maybe the goal is not to get in touch with reality. Maybe the goal is transformation. Now, what do we mean by transformation? Maybe we mean by transformation, get in touch with reality. In which case, it reduces to what I, the art reduces to what I said before. But maybe it's not. Say, for example, even if uh, we were all to become convinced that the near-death experience is not real, the sense of reflecting what the other life is really like, there may be a sense in which it is very transformative for the person to believe that. In other words, if you define transformation in terms of sense of well-being, better able to function in the world, and so forth and so on, uh, may be very good. Uh, transpersonal psychology aside, being in touch with reality does not necessarily lead to transformation. That does not follow logically. Maybe it's true and maybe it's not. I'm fine think it's not. But uh, whatever, again, it's not something that follows that follows logically. So maybe from the point of view of transformation, uh, there might be more value in doing entirely different things than you would do if your if the primary goal was to be in touch with, with reality. And I'd like to end this this tirade with a uh, with a, with a basically a, a a kind of uh, plea for humility. I want to go back to uh, getting in touch with reality. My, as my framework for that. Uh, essentially, you know, why is it that we want to 
let's take it a step further. Why is it that we want to have this sense of reality? Well, why is it that you know, we want the ultimate cognitive theory? Why do we want to unify science, for example? And basically, I, I really come back to what I only think all ethical philosophy is reduced to, and that's hedonism. It's basically, it does it because it gets us some kind of satisfaction. Driven out by the basic science. You've heard the quote from Einstein and how they all have mystical experiences when you look at the equals MC squared. So I would say even science can be transformative uh, in, in, in that sense, but particularly something that is very satisfying. And even though that's kind of a pejorative kind of word, I think that's basically what we're dealing with. We have these kinds of experiences and we want to we want to study them, know more about them, get into our depth psychology because that is satisfying and fulfilling to us in some way. What I'm suggesting is different things are going to be fulfilling to different people. I remember you, know, you all heard Carl Sagan talk about the billions and billions of stars. And here's a scientist who's really getting turned on by scientific theory. And then I, and there was a quote by the philosopher Paul Byron, who was really trying to attack scientific hubris. And I certainly agree with the parts of your remarks where you're talking about scientific hubris. Um, Byron comes back and says, what's the big deal? I can't relate to somebody who gets turned on by a bunch of rocks out in space. So obviously different things, and that's really fire off his point, that different things uh, turn on different people. So I guess in the back of my humility thing, let's, let's not get in a position where we uh, denigrate what someone else is doing simply because we put ourselves in that position and wouldn't uh, satisfy us in the way a sign satisfies him. What I think there is too much of, and I see it particularly in parapsychology, but when, I, when I read your paper, it reminded me of some things that Rhea White's been saying that I've been very, very critical. I don't, I don't really go quite as far as she does. But, you know, is this really us versus them kind of thing? Which I think, by the way, I think was started by the scientists. And now I think we're getting kind of a reaction to it. The fact that we yeah, have hubris on the one end is kind of meeting the hubris on the other side. And what I try to argue with, with her was that there's value in all these approaches. And uh, you know, let's not be so judgmental about them, and let's, and let's recognize that what accomplishes something for person X, something different might accomplish the same, thing for, same kind of thing for person Y. Well, as uh, Freud would say, a scientist is basically someone who has uh, uh, created a few of the sexual fantasies for some mathematical ones. <laughs> or Harry Murray, who said basically that in this world there's two kinds of people. I think there are two kinds of everybody else. No, no. <laughs> I, I hope that you actually. That uh, basically, I think that uh, uh, there is a visionary tradition that you've either seen it or you haven't. And if you've seen it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, you have the slightest clue what I'm about to say. And uh, the interesting thing is, I, I had this really wonderful professor of. Uh, medicine from Yale, who has a steady carol next to me in the medical school, Dr. Alicia Atkins. He was a very famous uh, person at Yale for many years, and heading one of the houses. And he was a very sympathetic and compassionate physician, and, you know, who learned all the science that he needed to. And, uh, you know, he came in just storming one day. He's been retired for a number of years. I said, well, what's the matter with you? He says, you know, I've just been thinking about it, and I'm just furious. I said, what is it? He said, well, you know, all my life, I've been this kind of compassionate and loving and warm person. And I've been up against all these people who are kind of the numbers racket and the surgery and the measurement. And, and I figured that I was inferior to them because I, I, I didn't know what that was. And I hadn't quite grasped it. And I didn't think I was good enough to grasp it as well as they had grasped it. So you know what I did? I worked really extra hard and all of my life. I spent all of my life grasping that in order to be a success there. And you know, I found that I didn't find out until I retired one of the most important things, and that was that those people don't know anything else but that. And I know both things. And I'm just mad that it's taken me this long to find that out. So I think that there's some credence to that notion, however much hubris that may basically put upon it. I mean, I think it's about time we got it together and started to assert what the real relationship really might need to be, frankly. And if it's not that way, to create it by fiat if we need to. I mean, because that's actually the way uh, they did it a hundred years ago in scientific psychology. So that's the reason why I'm being a little bit militant. Uh, okay, let me, let me make one very brief point. 
Uh, I think uh, one point I can make, I'm not quite sure this is what you may be getting at the sense, but uh, uh, I think it's fine if if, uh, if you think you're selling better mousetrap than the next guy, you convince the other guy that you know, if you look at this hole, you're going to find something superior. I think that's, that's fine. I think that would end up Although I'm not really attached to that, but I'd like to kind of put that forward. Um, I just I just like to discuss something that um, you said, John. And, and I don't know if I've heard this correctly or not, but I and I think I've heard Eugene kind of talk over the day a little bit about how we invalidate certain kinds of experiences and phenomena. And I think you can't talk about science without talking about this. Michael like talked about paradigms before and talked about Q and, and a lot of the work that's been done that where where people just interpret reality based on the current paradigm. And, and we don't know whether that's a situation that we were faced with. When you talk about people that have near-death experiences, I mean, have any people are saying, this is what happened to me, and we say, no, it's not really what happened to you. This is what happened to you. And I think that it's tough when you, you know, 50 years from now, it'll be real clear who was right and who wasn't right. But when you're sitting in the middle of it, it's really tough to decide, you know, should we pursue this avenue? Does this, is this really a paradigm shift? Is this something that's telling us something that should be investigated, et cetera? Or is it something that really does just stay within the normal way that we use to interpret it? Or do we need new, new ways of investigating and new ways of looking at it? And I, I would challenge somewhat, though, the emphasis that you have placed on reality versus you know, my fantasy about reality. In other words, I think what, what science is really confronting is the epistemological conception of multiple realities. And that is really going to transform science. And it's going to mean that out there in the material world, that's really the only reality there is. And all the rest of what's going on in my mind is like kind of idealism or myth or something like that. I, I don't think that's what's, what, what's coming as far as the future transformation of science. And I think in the neuroscience revolution, we most cogently see that it's the data that's coming out of the new biology of consciousness. Now that you know we're looking at the organ that's creating science in the first place, and philosophies of mind are now coming back as a vengeance. It's precisely these things that have been winnowed out 100 years ago when they were on a roll that now becomes the major uh, issue uh, uh, to uh, look at the possibility of these multiple realities. I just wanted to make one brief response to something that Adam said. Uh, again, this is getting into uh, near death experiences. One, one thing that I know the same thing with same thing happens with out of body experiences, which is an area that I've been involved in. And it's very important to make a distinction between experience and inferences make from an experience. When a person tells you that uh, I had an experience of what the afterlife is really like, that person is not describing their experience. They are making an inference from that experience, and that has to be judged as such. And you can get in a lot of trouble with, uh, by not making a distinction between the experience on the one hand, which I think can be valid, it should be in and of itself validated and, and, and appreciated, and the inference from the experience, which I think at least as long as we're, uh, in some sense, uh, admitted to Western logic, is just plain wrong. Hi there. My name is Lisa Coley, and I serve as president of Parapsychology Foundation. I want to welcome you to the Foundation's YouTube channel. There's already a wealth of information available posted, and we have plans to continue to post our classic lectures and new materials. So you don't want to miss out, so hit that bell. Please subscribe and you'll be notified and hope you enjoy.